Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Bob Vetter. He is here to talk about his life as a healer. He first got interested in becoming a healer when he started discovering his interest in non-Western spirituality. So there'll be a lot of different topics that we'll cover, and I'm excited to hear a little bit more about him. So Bob, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you, Sarah. So nice to be here. So as you described a moment ago, um, yeah, I I right now am a healer. Um, my background, though, about how I ended up on that road is perhaps one that is uh, a story worth talking about. So my academic background is as a cultural anthropologist. And from the time that I was a kid, I was interested in spirituality. And when I was in junior high and high school, I was reading books on Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism, practicing yoga at a time where there wasn't a yoga school on every corner of every street in the entire United States. It was actually kind of fringe, I guess, at that time. And I was really interested in pursuing um, philosophy. I wanted to understand the nature of the universe. I wanted to know what was what was reality, you know. So I I was studying philosophy. I was studying anthropology, and the way I would describe it is that philosophy describes the ideal, and anthropology describes the real, the way that people actually do things. So I, as an undergraduate, I went to college at SUNY Oneonta, State University of New York, at Oneonta, and I studied. Um, anthropology with a minor in philosophy. And then while I was there, I got to go to India. And what I thought was going to be my life's work was studying spirituality and healing, but in Asia, not in the areas that I would eventually find myself. So I, I planned on going, I thought I was going to end up going to the University of Hawaii. And I was would have done my field work in South Asia and Southeast Asia. But as it turned out, I didn't get into the program that I thought I would. And I had a philosophy professor at Oneonta who knew a philosophy professor also from India who was teaching at the University of Oklahoma. So he, the guy in Oklahoma, sent a letter or, or called my professor and said that he was looking for a promising young graduate student at the University of Oklahoma. So I started out in the philosophy department with an assistantship. So I moved out to Oklahoma. I got accustomed to being there and settled into the course of study and found out I really didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be studying philosophy. And somehow everything that had seemed so beautiful to me and so wonderful as an undergrad, all of a sudden was not interesting at all. And I was basically going to just get in my car and drive back to New York, where I was from and where I live now. And at the last minute, I decided that I would just go into the anthropology department and just find out, you know, if there was any way for me to do something there. So I walked into the anthropology department. I met met the um, met the department chairman, told him what my situation was that I had this assistantship and I'm basically ready to move back to New York unless you guys have something that you can offer me. And he said, "Well, as a matter of fact, you can keep your full assistantship if you're willing to teach a course in Introduction to Anthropology." Now, what I didn't realize at the time was. The day before I walked in there, somebody walked out of the anthropology department and they desperately needed somebody that day to fill that position to teach intro to anthropology. So I went from being an undergraduate to teaching undergraduates. And um, in order to maintain a full-time course load to have my assistantship, 
it was too late to even enroll in courses in the anthropology department. So I was in this catch-22. I needed to be a full-time student in the anthropology department, but I couldn't get into any of the courses that were being taught. So we decided that I would do an independent study in what is called ethnography. And for the listeners who don't know about this aspect of anthropology, so anthropology is the study of human beings, and anthropologists look at every aspect of what it is to be a human being. Cultural anthropologists like me are interested in cultures. And within cultural anthropology, there are two basic categories. One is called ethnography and one is called ethnology. So ethnography is when you study one culture in depth. You can have an area of interest, but you're looking at basically one culture by using what's called the participant observation method, where you live with the people and you share their life and you ask lots of questions during interviews. Ethnology is when you have a research question and then you look at how people all over the world address whatever that concern is. So I decided that I would do a project on ethnography. And I wanted to find out about the local native people. And I thought that this would just be kind of an interim project for me, something that I could do on the way to getting to the field work that I really wanted to do eventually. So I, I, went, to, I went to my advisor, who was an old man who had been do- conducting studies among the tribes, particularly the Apaches in Western Oklahoma, like most of his life. And I told him that my area of interest was spirituality and healing. And I was hoping that you would be able to point me in the right direction. So he thought about it for a moment. And what he said was, you're going to have to use what we call a networking approach. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I I want to meet a medicine man. And he said, well, using a networking approach, what you'll do is you'll just go out and meet people and let the people that you meet send you to somebody else who sends you to somebody else who sends you to somebody else and theoretically you will eventually end up with the kind of person that you want to talk to so i was really kind of discouraged from that by that because i thought he would give me a an address or a phone number or something that i could follow up with so i went back to my apartment i told uh jim who was this guy i i'd met him on a message board uh you know who needed a roommate so I met, I got back and I told this guy, Jim, that I was living in the apartment with, uh, you know, what I told him what happened. And he, and he said, well, maybe I can help you. And I said, well, I don't see how you can help me. And he said, well, I'm part Comanche. He said, maybe, uh, you know, next time my family has a gathering, I could bring you along with me. So the next time ended up being like a week or two later and Jim and I got in the car and we drove all the way to Southwest Oklahoma. And when we got to this family picnic, it was a, what I would find out later was a fairly typical Native American gathering. So the men were all sitting in folding chairs under a shade tree while the women were all putting the meal together. Now it was mostly old men and Jim and I, you know, two young guys and I walked up and Being a New Yorker maybe is what made me think that I should just be very direct in my approach. And I said, hi, I said, uh, my name is Bob Vetter. I'm a student in the anthropology department. And I was hoping that I might be able to meet a medicine man. And all of a sudden it was like crickets. You, nobody said anything. Everybody was just staring at me. And it was, when I tell you it was an awkward moment, I am understating the case. So finally, um, gr- and gratefully, one of the women came up and said, oh, the meal is ready. You men can come on over to the picnic tables. So we all sat down to eat. J- Jim and I sat together and we were eating. And After the, the meal was over, an old man came up to me kind of when nobody was looking. And he said, you know, I heard what you said about wanting to meet a medicine man. He said, from what I understand, we still have one medicine man left among our people today. I don't know his 
phone number. He doesn't have a phone number. I don't know exactly um, what his address is, but I, I can draw you a map. And he took a napkin and drew me a map of how to get to this guy's house. He said his name is Woody Watchataker, and he doesn't have a phone. So Jim and I, you know, we left that gathering. I kind of figured out that I had done something wrong. I, I wouldn't find out until later that medicine is not a topic that you generally bring up in casual conversation. Either the topic of spirituality or the topic of healing, because Native American religions were against the law in the United States until 1978. And certainly medicine, practicing medicine without a so-called license has been against the law as well. So there are a lot of good reasons why they might not want to talk about this to an outsider. So I had the, the name of this guy, Would You Watch a Taker? And Jim and I got in the car and we drove all the way down to the area where he lived, which should have been an hour and a half ride, but probably tack on another hour and a half because we got so lost until we finally found his house. And we got out of the car and walked up to the front steps of his house, little white house kind of all out by itself. And the two of us walked up to the door, I knocked on the door, and I remember thinking to myself as I was walking up to the door, I'm really glad that Jim is here because since he's part Comanche, he'll know what to do and he'll know what to say. So we got up to the door, knocked on the door. This old man comes to the door with long hair and braids and looks at me and looks at Jim. And I was waiting for Jim to say something. And apparently Jim was waiting for me to say something. And he's waiting for something because there's two strangers at his front door. So finally, I figured, well, you know, somebody's got to say something. here. So I just, again, blurted out the first words that came to my mind. And I said, hi, I said, my name is Bob Vetter. I'm an anthropology student from the University of Oklahoma. And I was hoping you would talk to us a little bit about the Comanches. And again, he didn't say a word. He just stared at us. And then finally he spoke and he said, this is how you come to my house? And I didn't know what he was getting at, so I said, yeah. And he said, this is the way you come to my house to see me? And I said, yeah. And he said, come in here a minute. So he opened his door and he pointed to the couch off to the side of the doorway. And he said, sit down over there. Now, he was inviting Jim and me into his house, but this was clearly not a friendly invitation. So Jim and I sat down and kind of looked at each other because we didn't know what was going on. And he stormed out of the room, came back a moment later with this painting in his hand. And he held the painting up and he said, see this? I said, yeah. I said, wow, that's really beautiful. It was a painting he had done of a, of a Comanche war dancer. But he wasn't really interested in what I thought about his painting. He said, he said, see this? And I said, yeah. And he said, I'm an artist and I have better things to do than to sit around talking to you. And another thing he said, that's no way to visit an Indian. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you're going to visit an Indian, the least thing you could do is bring him something to eat. Now, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I just got up off the couch. I said, I'm really sorry. Jim and I walked out the door, got back in the car, and drove all the way back to Norman, to the town that we live. Neither of us really said much because we were kind of rattled by what had happened. And when we got to, back to Norman, the university town, I mentioned something about when I go back. And he said, you're going back to that guy's house? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, I wouldn't go back to that guy's house if you paid me. And he was really kind of hot about the whole thing. He wanted nothing to do with Woody. So let me say that I was a very, very poor graduate student. I mean, I, I had zero extra money besides my basic expenses. So I got what I could the next week. You know, I went to the grocery store and got some pathetic few groceries in a brown paper bag and drove back to Woody's house, got out of the car, knocked on the door, came to the door again. This time he looked at me, he looked at the paper bag, and he got a big smile on his face. And he said, now that's the way you visit an Indian. 
And that day is the day that I think that my journey really, really began. Because Woody became a close friend, a mentor. He answered all of my questions about the Comanches that I wanted to know. It turned out that his wife, Eva, was the niece of a very famous Comanche medicine woman that a book had been written about by an anthropologist from the University of Oklahoma. The book was called Sonapia, Comanche Medicine Woman. So they were both in a position to answer a lot of the questions that I had. I still needed to meet this medicine man. So he said, yeah, you know, he said, we do have this one medicine man left among our people. Now, every time I would go to his house, he would, you know, I would interview him. We would talk. He would answer lots of questions. Eva would come in. We would joke around, you know, very, very friendly. Every time I went there, I would say, well, do you think you could introduce me to this, to this medicine man? And he'd say, well, yeah, but, you know, today's not a good day. And then I'd leave. I'd come back the next time, ask him the same thing. Yeah, well, today's not a very good day. And this went on again and again and again. It was getting later in the semester. Now, I have a, a project coming due. So I'm at this point, I'm, you know, trying to figure out what I'm going to do, how I'm going to fulfill my academic requirements. And finally, one day out of frustration, I said to him, listen, I know you're really busy, but maybe you could just give me directions on how to get to this man's house. He said, oh, OK, yeah. So he drew a map on a piece of paper and, the, and then he explained the map. And the map was like, yeah, so, you know, you go down this hill and you cross this wooden bridge with your car. Be careful when you go over that bridge, you know, and then you come to this fork in the road and you go left and when you get to the farm make a right you know it's these kind of directions and he says you got that and i said yeah and i but i really didn't have it at all so i got into my car and i was just about to drive back to norman and i hear him come out of his house and he's kind of yelling and he goes wait a minute he said wait a minute you know what he said you'll never find this on your own he said you go in your car and i'll go in my car you can follow me so now, by now, the sun is going down. It's getting dark. We have the headlights on, and we're driving through the back end of absolute nowhere on dirt roads that are unmarked, and I had no clue where I was. So by the time we get there, it's pitch black. We get to this cul-de-sac, dirt road cul-de-sac. He turns his car back around to face the opposite direction of the direction my car is in. And he opens his car door and he points down a driveway and he says, that's it. Closes his door and drives off. So now I am totally in the middle of nowhere. I don't know where I am. I don't know anything about this man that I'm going to see. And I don't have a gift to give him of any kind because by then I learned that you should bring something. If you're going to ask somebody to help you, you bring them something. And, and later on, I would find out that there are... Uh, much more cul culturally appropriate ways to do it. That's a different story. So, drove my car down this long, long driveway that led to a little tiny house. And I turn the engine off, and the outside light goes on in the house. And then I see the door open, and I see the door slam shut. Then... There are dogs that come up and start barking and growling at me. So I cautiously get out of my car. And I, now, when I see the door open and I see the door close, I'm thinking, now remember, I, I was a young man and I came from New York and I was out in rural Oklahoma. So I was thinking to myself, I don't even know if I'm at the right house. Now, for all I know, what happened just now is somebody in that house opened the door, looked out at me, and went in to get a shotgun. And if they kill me, nobody will even know where I am because I'm totally out in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows where I am. So I walk up as cautiously as I can to the front door and I knock on the door and an old lady comes to the door. And I said, hi, I said, I'm, I'm looking for Oliver Pataponi. And she just kind of looked at me and said, uh-huh. And I said, well, does he live here? And she said, yeah. Now, I figured, well, maybe she'd invite me in. But 
she just stood there looking at me. So finally I said, well, would it be okay for if I came in and met him? And she said, yeah. So she opens the door. Now I'm thinking, you know, again, all I am is full of stereotypes. And that's really an important part of the story. Because all I knew about Native people were all of the stereotypes that I had grown up with in cartoons and, you know, ridiculous images. So I figured if I was going to meet a medicine man, that I was going to go into a teepee, there'd be a fire burning and he'd be smoking a pipe, a, a ceremonial pipe. But I, she opens the door and I walk in and here is this old man sitting on a couch watching a football game on television. And I thought, how beautiful that is. <laughs> that all of my stereotypes were destroyed in that moment. So I met him and I told him, you know, I would love to be able to talk to you. And he said, he said, sure. He said, you can come back next week and we'll talk. And he gave me directions on how to get out of there. And in a very warm way, he said, be careful going home. So I went back to the university and I told my advisor what had happened. And he said, well, he said that, you know, that's great. He said, now you, you can start the process. And I said, well, what do you think I need to know? And he said, well, don't talk about medicine. So now he decides to tell me, don't talk about medicine, right? He said, don't talk about medicine. And I said, well, what am I going to talk about? And he said, well, pick out something that's kind of an innocuous topic. Maybe you could ask him about traditional stories. So I looked into Comanche traditional stories, I had a long list of questions prepared, got to his house the next week, took out my pad of paper, ready to ask him questions. And I asked him about traditional stories. Thought about it for a moment, and he thought about it, and this is what he said. He said, you know, my, my wife's sister talks to somebody from the university about those kind of stories. He said, but as far as I'm concerned, those are just a bunch of fairy stories. He said, but if you want to know stories about what really happened, I can tell you those stories. And I said, sure. And he said, I can tell you stories about things that I know happened because I was there. And he started to lay out for me the story about how he came to be a medicine man. And it turned out that he didn't want to be a medicine man, but he got sick with cancer and went, to the, went into the hospital. And he was hospitalized for quite some time. Until finally, one of the doctors came in and what he said was, he said, uh, we doctors, we had, we had several meetings about your case and we've discussed it. And we've decided that we've done everything for you that we can. You can stay here if you want. We can try to ease your pain for you, but there's nothing left for us to do. No, he said, um, I'm going to try to take care of this the way that the old folks used to. Take me out there to the hills and leave me there and let me fast out there. Now, let me kind of back up to explain what this means. For the Plains Indians and really for Native Americans all over North America, there was a custom called that anthropologists and other non-Native people call the vision quest, where you go up to a mountain or a hilltop or a well-known place of power and you fast there, no food, no water, no shelter, no comforts, no companionship over whatever the span of time is that you decide that you're going to go there. And if everything is right about you, you may experience something. You may be visited. You may be, um, your life may be altered in some way. So he said, uh, I knew about this place because some years before, a friend of mine had gone there. He said, so my son dropped me off and I had nothing with me but a sheet to cover myself up with, some tobacco, four corn shucks, and an eagle feather. And he said, I, you know, he explained what everything was for. The sheet was to cover up the eagle feather as the symbol of power, of, of um, the sacred, the communication between a human being and the creator. And of course, tobacco is the means that we have of our communication. 
that the smoke carries our prayers up to the creator. So he, he got to that spot, he waited, um, and nothing happened through the day, nothing happened at night. He said, but towards morning, he could hear a rustling of leaves toward a mountain called Mount Scott. This was the night of a new moon, so there was no light out at all. And he said he could hear that rustling of leaves. And when he looked up, he said, I saw, I saw this flame flickering in the distance. And it was getting closer and closer, moving towards me. And he said, as it got closer, I started to be able to make out a human form. And as it got even closer, he said, I, I could make out, it was a, it was a Comanche elder wearing buckskin clothing. And Grandpa Chief, um, I should say I'm calling him Grandpa Chief because eventually he adopted me as a grandson. He took me as a member of his family. So Grandpa Chief, he said, uh, he said, finally, when he got up close enough to me, he said he shot me with fire. What the flame was that he had been seeing was this flickering of flame that every time the visitor exhaled, fire came out of its mouth. But when he got right up in front of Grandpa Chief, he, he, said, he said he shot me with that fire. And when the fire hit me, he said that was it. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't talk. My heart stopped. Everything stopped. Until finally, he said, the visitor spoke to me, and when he spoke, he said, son, he said, what are you doing here? And Grandpa Chief said, I'm sick. And the visitor said, there's nothing the matter with you. He said, you're going to be all right, but they sent me to take care of somebody who's real bad off. And with that, the visitor, he started to take off towards the west, but Grandpa Chief said he turned around one last time to me, and he said, son, he said, did you know that this whole world that we live in stops for a very little while right before morning? And that's the time when things like me can enter into this world. With that, the visitor took off to the west. Grandpa Chief he waited out the time that he had there until finally his son came up to him and his son ran up and he said, Dad, he said, are you all right? Grandpa Chief said, yeah, I'm fine. And he said, well, you know, it was so cold last night. How did you make it through the night? And he said, well, where I was at, it was like springtime. Well, when they got down off that little rise, there was a hard frost on the ground everywhere except for where Grandpa Chief had been. So that's the first really kind of interesting thing, curious thing, miraculous thing. But the next thing that happened was that he didn't have that cancer. And he lived for a long, long time after that. He never went back to the doctors, but he never had the cancer. And then the third part of that story is that eventually he found out that whatever that power was that entered into him, that cured him of his cancer, also gave him the power to heal other people who are sick. He was walking down the street one day and an old medicine woman saw him and she said, what happened to you? And he said, nothing. What are you talking about? She said, there's something different about you. So finally he broke down and he told her what happened. She said, well, you know, you may not realize it right now, but you're good for something. And sometime soon you're going to find out what that is. And he started to think about the things that he had seen when he was a boy. Now he was born, we don't even know because they didn't keep track of records like that. But he was born either in the late 1800s or around 1900. So nobody knows exactly when. But he saw the old time medicine men doctoring and healing people with the ways that we can't even imagine. But he started to remember that and he started to understand how the event that had shaped his life went into him becoming the kind of healer that he was. And he became what's called a coal doctor, meaning that he used red hot coal to doctor somebody who was sick. And the way that he explained it to me was, 
sickness is like a fire and you've got to fight fire with fire. So he would build a fire and then he would let it go until the, the coals in it were glowing red hot. And then he would take one of the coals out using his fingers and put the coal in his mouth. And that's what would activate his power. And he said that then the patient would become like wet cement in his hands and he could shape that person to the way that they were supposed to be and bring them back to a state of wellness. So this is this was like the formative story for me. This was what helped me to understand what it is to be a healer and the obligation that he had to the people in his community who would come to rely on him. Eventually, Grandpa Chief passed away um, right around the time uh, not that long after I graduated from OU. And I went on to know another group, a whole bunch of different people, different native elders in different nations, um, mostly Kiowa, Comanche, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Caddo, lots of different tribes. And I got to be involved in the, the, the spiritual and ceremonial ways of the people. And at one point, I started taking groups of people out to Oklahoma who wanted to learn about traditional Native ways. We would sleep in teepees for a week at a time, and we would travel on a circuit from one Native community to another. And my relationships deepened over the course of those years. And eventually, another old man adopted me named Richie Tartza who was also a medicine man. He was from the Kiowa tribe. And m many, many, many years later, he would ask me to um, write down the story of his life and his family. And we did uh, what I would describe as a collaborative ethnography. That's where you get the, the native voice pure, un undiluted by somebody else's interpretation. So that book that we did together was called Big Bow, The Spiritual Life and Teachings of a Kiowa Family. And it was an attempt to preserve these stories, but also talk about his methods of doctoring. So I was learning about these ceremonies. I was learning about these ways of, of doctoring over the course of these years. Now, when I was at the university, there was, I had a parallel separate interest in something called curanderismo, which is a traditional form of healing from ancient Mexico. I was taking a course at the university as a graduate student with a professor who had done his fieldwork in Oaxaca, Mexico. And he mentioned in passing that there was still this practice called curanderismo and that there are still traditional healers who utilize it today. So I stayed after class. I asked him about it. I got interested in it. Eventually, did um, other projects based on the academic understanding of curanderismo. But importantly, I decided that I was going to do two studies. I would do a short-term study of curanderismo in San Antonio, Texas, because I could drive there from Oklahoma, and then go spend a year in Oaxaca doing field work among the healers there. As it turned out, I took a master's degree and kind of forgot about that for many, many years, moved back to New York. I joined at one point a chapter of the Native American church, which is the peyote religion that began in Oklahoma in the late 1800s. And I joined this chapter and I told them that I wasn't going to be able to attend many of their ceremonies or their called meetings. Um, but if there was one that they could recommend that I could go to um, maybe once a year, I would try to do that. And they said, yeah, well, we, you know, we have this annual pilgrimage ceremony where we go and gather the medicine that we're going to need for upcoming ceremonies. So we have this meeting down there near the Mexican border in a town called Miranda City, Texas. So I had to figure out how to get to Miranda City, Texas. I ended up flying into San Antonio. Now, if you remember, San Antonio was where I was going to do my field work. So I flew in and I realized this was where I was going to do my field work. And I would try to find out if there was anybody still practicing curanderismo over the course of these years that had ensued. 
I couldn't find anybody until the last day that I was there. I found an obscure newspaper article that talked about a woman named Berta, who was a curandera. And it said that she, it just mentioned in passing, that she worked at a particular store in San Antonio. So I showed up at the store years after this article had been written, walked in the door, she was there working, and it was like I had known her my entire life. I stayed for the day, and then I was supposed to leave the next morning. A blizzard in New York prevented all planes from landing, so I ended up staying an extra four days to be with her and begin the process of learning from her. I went on from her to a woman named Elena Avila, learned curanderismo from her. She was the author of a book called Woman Who Glows in the Dark. I was learning about traditional medicine, traditional curanderismo, how they heal, what their spirituality is, what their ceremonies of purification are. And then eventually um, went to the annual conference on curanderismo that takes place at the University of New Mexico. And that was where I met two more of my teachers, one of them who lives in Oaxaca. And I started making trips to Oaxaca. So all those years later, this whole story came full circle. I ended up in San Antonio and in Oaxaca just because of events that fell into my lap. But that became the core of the healing work that I would end up doing is what I learned in curanderismo, and then eventually I would go on to learn a whole bunch of other healing modalities like medical qigong from China, various kinds of energy work. Uh, I learned um, Ericksonian hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming. All of these different methods have kind of come together for me in that way. So the, my own healing journey of how I healed from the various things that I needed to work on in myself eventually led me to be able to do this work for other people, through teaching, through workshops, through one-on-one -on -one work, and through the Temascal, which is the Mesoamerican version of the sweat lodge. So that brings me to today and the work that I do now. Yeah, and I loved hearing all like the entire journey and like how you know as you were just saying it was coming full circle and and it's so interesting because you were diving into stories that probably so many people don't know or, or haven't heard about before um so now you obviously took a very practical educational viewpoint like that's where this all started was in the education and and working through a bunch of things and and healing within yourself so at any point when you were on this journey did you have a moment of like is this the right thing to be doing absolutely i mean first of all when i got to the universe when i even got to the university of oklahoma i i, I said to myself what am i doing here this isn't this isn't the university I thought I was going to go to. This is not the course of study that I thought I wanted to do. And when I walked into the anthropology department that day, I still didn't have any kind of a, wow, this is my path feeling. So I doubted myself every step along the way. I bungled my way through countless encounters with Native people. Um, and, and really had huge challenges along the way. So I doubted, I doubted this path. I mean, it wasn't until even years after I made my way back to New York after graduating at the University of Oklahoma before I looked back on it and said that there was a meaning and there was a purpose and there was a trajectory to it. You know, it's easy to, when you're, when you're looking ahead, it's hard to see the plot line in a story. So now I can look back on the many, many years of my past and I can connect the dots and I can stitch it together into a narrative that makes, allows me to make sense of my life and make meaning out of, you know, the many 
the many terrible challenges, the many things that really stood in the way along the way. Now, what is it like being a healer and not being Native? Yeah, well, I so first of all, I think it's important to say that I am not claiming to do Native North American healing. And that's an important thing to understand because mm -hmm. I, you know, the, the healers that I know and knew were happy to share with me. They were happy to um, share the ceremonies with me, the religious ceremonies with me. Um, and I am not comfortable claiming that I am doing that for other people. Now, Purinderismo is a completely different thing because the teachers that I had there, they want me, they encouraged me to go out and share it with the non-indigenous world. So that's kind of a that's kind of a different story with them. So I prefer to say that that my the work that I do is indigenous informed. That it comes out of my personal experience. And I'm not claiming to do anything other than uh, what my teachers encouraged me to do. And they also encouraged me to go out and learn other things, other modalities. Um, you know, one of them, Rita Navarrete Perez, from outside of, of uh, Mexico City, she's the one who really encouraged me. She said, what you need to do is to improvise. You need to be creative in your approach, approach to creating ceremony in the moment to help people to heal. And that was what I really felt like gave me the license to um, put together things in my own unique way. So curanderismo provides a template for how a healing session can work. And then these other things become like tools that can be used in a variety of different ways. Right. And that, and that makes a bunch of sense. Um, I might've kind of like worded my question a little bit poorly there. Um, but I think, you know, it goes a little bit back to even just like the beginning of your story and how you're talking about all you have is these stereotypes. So when you hear the word healer, um, you might not, you know, know all of these new words and, and the different modalities. Sure. Your question was very appropriate. <laughs> Thanks. So what is it that you do as a healer? So, yeah, so I have one-on-one -on -one work, which, you know, through COVID has been, a lot of it has been on Zoom, believe it or not. And I've had to modify, you know, even the hands-on work to facilitate the one-on-one. -on -one. I have a Temascal here that is called a, it's a community Temascal. And what that means is, that I hold this for the people. So people know that they can come here and they can go into the Temascal. And this is a ceremony of purification, a sweat ceremony of healing. Um, it was closed for a lot of COVID. I, I literally just opened a few weeks ago for the first time since COVID. So it's been it's been closed. So part of my healing work is in groups, um, either the Temascal ceremony, um, other types of group work, classes. Um, now, in the one-on-one -on -one work, largely what I use are two methods within curanderismo. One is called the platica, and that is a heart-to-heart -heart talk. So generally, when somebody comes for a healing session, they have an idea in mind of what they think the issue is. Usually, it has nothing to do with the reason that they came. And I used to use the analogy that it's like peeling an onion. And maybe a single session is like peeling an onion. But if it's continuous work, it's really more like, and I, I can't claim that I came up with this. Somebody, I, I can't even remember who told me, but it's more like peeling garlic because you may peel away one clove of it and think that you've gotten to the bottom of it. And then 
there's something next to it that all of a sudden reminds you that there's more to peel over there. So Platika is um, moving through layers of understanding to find underlying problems and issues that are often connected with emotion, because in Kurinderismo, we believe that most physical ailments, most ailments of any kind, whether it's mind, body, spirit, uh, or heart, have to do with human emotions, uh, that emotions are become out of balance, and that that can create sickness of any kind. So Platika is all about that, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one single session that's going to end and that's the end of it, or if it's a relationship that begins that will continue long, long term. And I have people who work with me who have been with me for over a year meeting once a week. So, you know, we can also go very, very deep. Then we take the concerns that are raised in the Platika portion and then perform something called Olympia. And Olympia is a, a spiritual cleansing. And frequently we use things like herbs, egg, flowered waters, water, all of these different things to physicalize along with Kopal, uh, which is a sacred resin that makes a, a smoke like an incense that's used for purification as well. And the, the Olympia ceremony becomes a way to ceremonialize the concerns that the person had that were expressed during the platika. We also use a tool called soul retrieval because within the system there is a belief in something called susto, which is soul fright. Uh, or spiritual fright. When we experience something that might be considered traumatic, a part of ourself gets left in that spot, at that place and at that time. And it becomes a strategy to help a person to survive something that is too overwhelming to deal with in the moment. So it's kind of a psychological, spiritual mechanism that we have built within us as human beings to allow us to go on and live when something is just too overwhelming in the moment. And usually there, one susto gives way to another, to another, to another, and it's like a wormhole, uh, each one taking a little bit of vitality away. And eventually it becomes problematic unless you deal with those sustos. And a lot of my work is helping people to reclaim the part of their soul or their vital essence that was lost in sustos in these I, I hesitate to use the word trauma because i sometimes think that it's overused but let's say overwhelming moments of spiritual fright so that's a good deal of the work also yeah i'm not sure i i have like I, I'm sure we could go into so many more topics, but you know, we can only record for so long. So I'm not sure I have any more specific questions because I, sure. I don't know where it's going to go, but I do want to ask if there's anything else that you would like to share with the listeners before I start to wrap things up. Yeah. Well, I guess what I want to share with listeners is my understanding of healing. I want to share that because mm -hmm. I think there is a misunderstanding that healing is what takes place only when there is a need because a sickness has come up. My understanding of healing is that every single one of us is on a healing journey of one sort or another. And it's a way that we make meaning out of the suffering of our lives. And if there's one thing I agree with in Buddhism, it's the idea that there is the inevitability of human suffering at some point in a person's life. But if we look at that suffering as being connected to the soul journey that we came into this world in order to have unfold, then we have compassion for other people in their suffering, and we do the best that we can to work on ourselves, to help other people, and ultimately to um, evolve, to make the most of this life. So that's just, that's a little piece of how the, the spirituality part of it connects. And it's also connected with our sense of 
the relationship that we have with the Creator, the relationship that we have with spiritual forces like the Four Seasons, the Four Directions, the Guardians of the Four Directions, the Above World, the Below World, how we orient ourselves in this magnificent universe. Um, I'd also like to, in closing, offer your listeners something for free on my website. So my website is bobvetter.com. And if you are interested in kind of a fun little free gift, it's a free download of a game that I put together that's based on the journey of the wounded healer. And that's every single one of us. Now, I based the game on a game called Shoots and Ladders. Do you know that game? Yeah. <laughs> so most of us played it as kids. What you might not know, though, is that Shoots and Ladders was originally a game from India that was created for Hindu monks to learn the nature of their, uh, their responsibility as a monk, their connection with the entire universe. And the game was played to help you along in your personal ev spiritual evolution. So I took the concept of that and applied it to the wounded healer. So the game is designed to be played by several people who want to play it together. You roll the die and you move your pieces along. And wherever you land, you get to either a ladder that is going to, when you have a susto, it could either drop you down to a lower level where you go backwards in your progress, or it could be an opportunity to go up, in which case you have resolved that issue and your spiritual progress knocks you up to the next level up above. So the game is designed to be played for fun, but also for people playing it to kind of talk about their own life journey, their soul journey. So... Anybody who's listening who wants a copy of that, go to bobvetter.com, and there's a free download on there for you. That's so interesting to hear, like, the origins of just what you think might be, like, a silly little board game. Um, and, of course, I will leave your website in the description for people to be able to find that download. And um, the website will also be linked on my podcast website. I have all of the resources from all past guests there as well. Now, before I close things out with all of my guests, I ask a random question. So my question for you is if you had chosen a different life path, what do you think you would be doing with your professional life? Wow. A different professional path. Um, perhaps teaching at a university. So, I mean, I mentioned that I didn't get, I didn't continue from my PhD and I, I have taught college courses. Um, but if I were, if I had done things differently, I probably would have ended up permanently as a university professor. And that's beautiful too. Um, it's just that it's a little bit more in the, the mind, in the, the realm of the brain and academics. I, I kind of like being involved in doing things. All right, that brings this episode to a close. As I mentioned, I will be leaving Bob's website in the description, and I will also be including right here right now a little bit of his personal plug for all of the things that his website includes. So rather than repeat everything, I'll just have him say it here. Well, that gives you information on how to get on my mailing list, um, and the mailing list will tell you about activities, courses, lectures, summits, all of the various things that uh, that I'm involved in and um, an opportunity to work on yourself in whatever capacity that means, any way that I can help you, the listener, on your life's journey, uh, your journey of the wounded healer. Uh, the website is kind of the portal for all of that including my podcasts, I should say that. I have a podcast called Healing and Spirituality in World Cultures, 
and you can access that um, at all of the major podcast platforms, but just as easily off right directly off my website, bobvetter.com. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast here, um, the website is in the description and that will bring you to all of our social media. And of course, you can always email the podcast. I love to have you as a guest and hear your story. I love how every story is so different. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, information for that is in the description as well. So thank you, Bob, so much for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. It's been a pleasure being here with you. I appreciate it very much.